Vasopressors can save your patient's life, but to use them safely, you need a solid understanding of how they work and what to watch for. In this video, we're going to review how vasopressors work, the receptors they target, when they're used, and how to think through patient presentations. Then we'll go and take a closer look at norepinephrine covering its clinical uses, when it's not appropriate to use, and the key nursing responsibilities every emergency nurse should know, since it's considered the workhorse of vasopressors. Vasopressors are used in critical situations to maintain perfusion when a patient's blood pressure is dangerously low. Norepinephrine is often the first line agent, especially in septic shock. While providers order the medication, nurses are the ones managing the drip, titrating, monitoring for side effects, and watching for complications like arrhythmias or extravasation. Early recognition of when vasopressors may be needed can also greatly improve outcomes. And because these medications can be dangerous if mishandled, nurses must know the protocols, like when we can use a peripheral IV for infusion, when to ask for an arterial line, closely monitoring vital signs, the rhythm and IV side, and being ready to alert the team if the patient isn't responding as they should. Vasopressors are powerful medications that constrict blood vessels to raise blood pressure. Depending on the type, they can also increase the heart rate, strengthen cardiac contractions, and affect the lungs. They work by stimulating specific receptors to improve circulation and maintaining perfusion to organs that are important like the brain, heart, and the kidneys. Adrenergic receptors are part of the sympathetic nervous system and respond to catecholamines like epinephrine and norepinephrine. They help the body respond to stress and are the targets of most vasopressors. Alpha-1 receptors are found in blood vessels and cause vasoconstriction, which raises blood pressure. Beta-1 receptors are in the heart. They increase heart rate and contractility. Beta-2 receptors are in the lungs and some blood vessels. They cause bronchodilation and mild vasodilation. We also have non-adrenergic receptors like V1 receptors activated by vasopressin, which cause vasoconstriction even when the body doesn't respond to catecholamines, like it can happen in septic shock. Dopamine receptors, on the other hand, are in the kidneys and they cause vasodilation at low doses and improve renal perfusion, while at higher doses, they help increase blood pressure, heart rate, and contraction. Each type of shock has a different underlying problem, and that determines which receptors we need to target. In septic shock, the issue is vasodilation and low perfusion, so we need to target alpha-1 receptors to constrict blood vessels, and if needed, just a little bit of beta-1 to support the heart. And we also have vasopressin or V1 if catecholamines aren't effective since it also causes vasoconstriction and improves blood pressure. Cardiogenic shock is about a failing pump, a failing heart. We need to focus on beta-1 to improve contractility and sometimes a little bit of alpha-1 if the blood pressure is too low. Though we avoid too much vasoconstriction because that puts strain on the heart. In hypovolemic shark, the primary treatment is fluids. You must resuscitate with fluids first in hypovolemic shock. And then if vasopressors are needed, we target alpha-1 for temporary blood pressure support while the patient stabilizes. In anaphylactic shock, it requires all three types of receptors to be affected. Alpha-1 for blood pressure, beta-1 for the heart, and beta-2 for the bronchodilation. In neurogenic shock, we have a loss of sympathetic tone, so we target both alpha-1 to restore vascular tone and beta-1 to support the heart rate and contractility. Choosing a vasopressor is all about matching it to the patient's physiology. Providers consider both the type of shock and how the patient is presenting. Is the issue regarding vasodilation? pump failure or a volume loss? Are they hypotensive? Is the heart rate low? Is the heart rate high? Is the heart contracting well? Are there signs of poor cardiac output? Are there any breathing issues like in anaphylaxis? Ultimately, the goal is to correct one or more of the main problems, low blood pressure, low cardiac output, low heart rate. Understanding this helps you anticipate the provider's choices and monitor for the right response. So now let's walk through a few common clinical examples. First, if a patient is hypotensive but tachycardic, their vessels, their vessels are too dilated but the heart is already trying to compensate. You don't want to increase the heart rate any further. So norepinephrine can be ideal here because it gives strong vasoconstriction with minimal heart stimulation. 
Phenylephrine is another option, but it's rarely used as a first-line agent. Second, if a patient is hypotensive and bradycardic, you need to raise both the blood pressure and the heart rate. Dopamine works well here since it stimulates both alpha-1 and beta-1 receptors at higher doses. Another great option is epinephrine, as it can also increase alpha-1 and beta-1. Third example, when a patient has a low blood pressure and a weak contractility, like in cardiogenic shock, you often start with norepinephrine for the blood pressure support, then you can add on an inotrope like dobiotamine once the pressure is stabilized. And finally, for the fourth example, if the heart is failing, so the pump is failing, the blood pressure is low, and the patient is also bradycardic, you know that you need to address all adrenergic stimulation, all of the receptors that we have, so that the contractility improves, the heart rate improves, and the blood pressure improves. A good choice here would be epinephrine. Again, these examples are to be helpful as a general rule of thumb, but real patients can be very complex with multiple factors, multiple underlying conditions, recent medications that they're on, acidosis, volume status, and so forth. All of those factors affect which vasopressor is most appropriate. Providers may make different choices based on the full clinical picture. So always be ready to adapt, to ask questions, to clarify, and to support the plan of care as it evolves. But these are a good rule of thumb to kind of help solidify what the general receptors are and how each presser kind of affects each situation. So norepinephrine also known as levofed primarily stimulates alpha 1 receptors causing strong vasoconstriction this raises blood pressure and makes it the first line vasopressor in most shock states especially in septic shock it also mildly stimulates beta 1 receptors which gives a slight increase in heart rate and contractility just enough to support cardiac output without pushing the heart too hard Norepinephrine is most ideal for septic shock, a type of distributive shock where the main problem is widespread vasodilation and low systemic vascular resistance. Its strong alpha-1 activity helps constrict blood vessels and raise blood pressure, while its mild beta-1 effects provide a bit of cardiac support without significantly raising the heart rate. Because it has minimal beta-2 activity, it avoids unwanted vasodilation. So again, norepinephrine just alpha one and a little bit of beta one without none of the beta two activity so this makes norepinephrine especially useful in septic patients who remain hypotensive even after fluid resuscitation has occurred it's a safer choice for older or fragile patients who can't tolerate excessive tachycardia while septic shock is the classic use case, norepinephrine is also used across many types of shock because it's a reliable presser with minimal cardiac strength. And by the way, if you're finding this helpful and want to save time and energy with mastering the chaos of the ER, check out our book and course. They're packed with everything you need to feel confident and prepared, including foundational content, clinical scenarios, quizzes, charting strategies, and practical ER tips. You'll find the links in the pinned comment and description below. There are going to be times when norepinephrine isn't going to be the best option. For example, in anaphylactic shock, norepinephrine won't help with bronchospasm or the airway swelling because it lacks beta-2 activity. For that, you need epinephrine, which stimulates alpha-1, beta-1, and beta-2 receptors. If the patient has bradycardia or heart block, norepinephrine won't increase the heart rate significantly. In these cases, for example, like in neurogenic shock, you're going to need something like dopamine or epinephrine that provides better, better chronological support. And then in hypovolemic shock, norepinephrine should only be given after the patient has been adequately fluid resuscitated. Because if you give a vasopressor, if you give norepinephrine in hypovolemic shock without fluid resuscitation, you worsen the vasoconstriction and worse in perfusion. So again, hypovolemic shock, the main thing is adequate fluid resuscitation. And in cardiogenic shock with normal blood pressure, norepinephrine can sometimes make things worse by increasing afterloads, putting more strain on a failing heart. In these cases, dobutamine is a better choice to boost contractility without increasing vascular resistance. There are several key responsibilities nurses must keep in mind when managing norepinephrine. First, Always titrate to a MAPCO, 
usually 60 for smaller patients, but it's somewhere typically 65 or higher. So just adjust to whatever your provider orders or whatever protocol you go with. Second, never give norepinephrine as a bolus. It must be a continuous infusion. Bolusing can cause severe hypertension or arrhythmias. Third, monitor blood pressure frequently every five minutes during titration. Use an arterial line if available for unstable patients. And then a central line is often preferred to avoid tissue necrosis. If you're using a peripheral IV temporarily because it's an emergency, your patient's about to crash if you don't get these vasopressors on board, just do your best to make sure that it's a large bore IV and a proximal vein like the, S it's like the AC veins and monitor closely for signs ex of extravasation. Do make sure that your provider is aware that you're using a peripheral IV so that they can also place a central line whenever they can. And then next, monitor for signs of that the perfusion is improving. You're looking for better blood pressure, better mental status, better urine output, and better skin signs overall. And just make sure that you notify the team if the patient is still hypotensive as they may need further interventions, they may need a re-evaluation, or they just may need additional vasal pressures to be added. And if it comes to this, you need to wean off slowly. Abruptly stopping norepinephrine can cause rebound hypotension. So taper under provider guidance and watch the BP closely during the process. Norepinephrine has a rapid onset with this effect starting within one to two minutes. So blood pressure needs to be monitored closely during initiation and titration. Its duration is short with a short half-life of two to three minutes, meaning it must be given as a continuous infusion. If the drip stops, blood pressure can stop quickly. That's why one of the most important critical care tips is that you don't let your infusions run dry for example, here, norepinephrine, if you let it run dry and you don't notice, your patient's blood pressure could just tank. Again, the most common concentration is 4 milligrams in 250 mLs, or you might also see 8 milligrams in 250 mLs. You're worried you end up using the 8 milligrams in 250 mLs, even though the 4 and 250 is a standard, when you're worried about patient's fluid status. If you don't want you know, the patient, for example, they're a CHF exacerbation patient, you don't want them getting more fluid. Instead of the 4 and 250, they might be in the 8 and 250 so that they can still get the appropriate dose without that extra fluid volume being administered. And again, always follow your facilities protocol for the starting dose, the titrations, and the maximum limit, which for the maximum, it's usually 30 mics per minute, but that can vary. So I recommend, again, double checking with your order, following your facilities protocol, and I recommend that you take a day or just ask your preceptor to go over all your facilities protocols for all sedation meds for all pressers so that you can make yourself a small cheat sheet that you can carry with you and have it as a quick pocket quick reference guide and after you're starting norepinephrine your job is to monitor closely for signs that perfusion is actually improving again you keep an eye on the map the goal is 65 or higher use your bp to constantly recycle it or you can use an a-line if you have it and you need to look for trends not just individual readings don't focus on the systolic alone the map is the best way for us to see how proficient is doing and you're watching for that trend of it improving you also want to assess mental status the patient should become if they're not intubated they should become more alert more responsive as cerebral perfusion improves if they remain confused or worsened, it may indicate ongoing hypoperfusion or perhaps a new issue. You also need to keep an eye on urine output. You also need to keep an eye on skins and capillary refill to assess improvement that the skin is returning to its normal color, a pink color, a warm color, and that a cap refill is under two seconds. Modeling or persistent cool extremities are going to be red flags that you need to keep communicating to the providers, especially if you already started the vasopressor. If you're also tracking lactate, it's important to keep an eye on it because a decreasing trend, a decreasing lactate is a good sign of improving perfusion and oxygenation delivery. And also keep an eye on the heart rate. It may go up just a little bit because norepinephrine has a little bit of beta-1 stimulation, but it should either stay stable or it should even go down if your patient was tachycardic and hypotensive. And again, watch for tachyarrhythmias. Again, if the map stays low after starting it and there's no improvement in urine production and mental status and the skin signs remain bad, the skin remains cold, mottled, you need to... Pro 
to notify the team and the provider immediately so they can adjust their treatment plan, add another vasopressor, and overall reassess and figure out what else can be done. And when you're using vasopressors, there's going to be a few critical factors to keep in mind. First is volume status. Vasopressors only work well if there's enough fluid in the system. If the patient is dry and not fluid resuscitated, vasoconstriction's not, vasoconstriction won't help. Unless contraindicated, like in cardiogenic shock, fluid should come first. Second is acidosis. If the patient has a pH below 7.2, vasopressors become less effective. Address the underlying issue, whether it's a sepsis, hypoxia, and so forth. And in some cases, providers may order bicarbonate to help improve responsiveness, to help improve the acidosis. And last, steroid use. In septic shock or other critical illnesses, some patients may have relative adrenal insufficiency. If there are multiple pressors or not responding to therapy, providers may order stress dose steroids like hydrocortisone IV to help replenish it because steroids help vasopressors, especially the catecholamines like norepinephrine and epinephrine work a little better. And I know it was a long video, so thank you for watching. If you have any tips or insights or experiences to share, feel free to leave a comment. We love to hear from you. We'd love for you to share the things that you've learned so that others can learn from you as well. And if you want to dive deeper into emergency nursing, you're going to find the links to our resources below. And as always, teamwork makes the dream work. And here at Emergency Chaos, we are proactive, not reactive.